All right, so again, the cell is the most basic form of life. Um, we've got, when they come together, we've got tissues when they work together. Tissues working together become organs. Organs working together become systems. And then when they're all the systems working together, become organisms, all right? Uh, like right now, you guys all have an integumentary system. Your integumentary system. And your integument is showing, okay? I see the integument on every one of you. What is it? What do you remember? Your skin, your skin, your hair, your nails, okay? Uh, we've got circulatory system, your heart, your blood vessels, okay? Those come together to form you, a full organism. But again, there are single cell organisms, bacteria, algae, etc. What I did was I tried to put together something to kind of show you guys. So we've got a single cell could be like a bacterium, right? But what happens if I have a flea? How many cells do, do I have? All right. Did a little research, about 200 million. Okay. Now, have you guys ever had to pick a flea off a dog? They are tiny. All right? They are, are almost microscopic, right? They're hard to see with the naked eye. They are 200 million times the size of one bacterium. Okay, so we're talking about tiny and then a whole other magnitude of tiny. As humans, we have about 50 trillion cells. That's a lot of cells, but if I am a blue whale, I have more like four quadrillion. Okay, um, does that make sense? Why does something, and how big, how big are blue whales? You guys know? About 100 feet. They, they're the biggest, the biggest animal on the planet that we have ever had, as far as we know, okay? As far as just sheer size and weight, okay? Um, much heavier than any dinosaur ever got. Uh, some dinosaurs got maybe a little longer, right? Diplodocus probably got a little bit longer, um, but no, nowhere near as heavy because Diplodocus was a land animal. Blue whales are waterbound. They can be as heavy as they want to be, the water is going to keep them more buoyant, okay? So we'll never have dinosaurs, at least I don't think, ever discovered that are anywhere near as heavy as a blue whale. Well, that's, and the problem is down at the bottom of the ocean, there's going to have to be something, it's going to have to be very adapted to the pressure. We're going to get to that. Actually, today we'll get to that a little bit. But does that make sense that a bigger animal has more cells? Yeah. Sure, thousands of times more cells, right? Because cells, do they change size much? I mean, we've got a bacterium, a bacterial cell is about the same size as your body cells, okay? So it's not like all of a sudden human cells are like this big and, and blue whale cells are this big, they're the same size, they just have a lot more of them, okay? Do you have to write down any of those as you're taking the notes? No. This is just so you guys can kind of see it. It's one of those things, I think it's kind of a cool little fact. You don't need to get this, okay? Up here, the blue stuff for sure, the way I would do this if I were writing notes, but you don't have to do it this way because again, our brains all work different. I would put cell most basic becomes a tissue, becomes an organ, etc. Okay, that's how I would I would do this this first. Okay, if you are still working, you know it's like I've got to write down every word. Don't do that. Okay, we'll try to get this to where this makes more sense for you. Okay, and make it easier for you. All right. Um, okay, so we'll go to the next slide. Slide number three. Okay, now this might be new stuff for you. Now we're gonna talk about a species. Now we talked about species some, what, last time when we were talking about animals. And we were trying to get as many different animals as we could. If it was a species, we allowed it, right? But if it was something like a dog, it was a breed. It was a little different, right? It's not its own species, so we didn't count it, okay? So a group of organisms that can mate and, re and produce fertile offspring, okay? We can have things that can mate and make babies, but they're not fertile, 
the babies have to be able to make babies of their own on down the line, or we're not working with a species. Okay? So uh, the geese that wander around are Branta canadensis. All right, do you need to write that down? Not necessarily, all right? We will be dealing with common name, scientific name, a lot. All right, when we get back from, um, from Labor Day weekend, we'll be, well, yeah, if we're back in, in and if, even if we're not, virtually, we'll be doing this anyway. Uh, we'll be talking about how to name things and who gets to name them and, you know, what rules they follow. We'll get into that. All right, so humans, homo sapiens, you guys all knew that, right? If you didn't, you do now. I, that would be one of those things I would make sure you commit that to memory. Uh, house cats, Felis domesticus. Where do you think we find them? What, what are they? They are domesticated, right? They're in our house, okay? Canis familiaris. They're very familiar to us. They're with us, okay? Um, a zebra, Equus quagga. Now we talked about how horses and uh, donkeys are both in the same genus. They're also in the same genus as, as zebras, okay, the equus. Can they make babies? Can they reproduce? If I've got a donkey and a, a horse, they can reproduce. What do they come up with? Hee-haw. A mule, okay? Mules don't reproduce and make fertile babies, okay? We can also have a zebra and a horse, and they call them zorses. Okay, it's, it's a it's a thing. You can it, it, they 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 have like striped haunches. You know, they got the stripes in the rear end, but kind of horse like in the front. They're interesting critters. Uh, they happen. Okay, usually they happen in like like Joe Exotics. You know, animal sanctuary. They, you, that's where you'll usually find them. Is because somebody bred this thing and it's just weird and it doesn't domesticate well and you know, it's, it's exotic, but it's not, what's that? Yeah, more than that, more, more like that. Yeah, it's, it's something, it's not something you necessarily want around your place because it's probably relatively wild. Zebras are really, really hard to tame from what I understand. And I, a zorse, zorses aren't any better, <laughs> okay? It's like it takes the worst parts of two things and puts them together, all right? Now, what do you notice about the words that I have there that I say are their species names? Well, they're in brown, right? That doesn't matter. I just did that to kind of bring them to you a little bit, all right? To kind of bring them, make them pop out. What do you know about that, though? What do you notice? How many words do I use for the scientific name? Two. It's always two, right? Branta canadensis. Homo sapiens. Two words. What do you also notice about them? What's that first word called? That's the genus, okay? What's the second word? That's the species. Okay, so we've got genus and species makes up the scientific name. We do not. So we use genus and species to make the scientific name. Okay, so humans are homo. Sapiens, okay, Homo sapiens, humans, that's, that's just the common name. What do you notice about the way I keep writing these? They're two parts, they're two separate words, right, it's two different words. I am capitalizing the genus. What about the species? It's lowercase, every time, what do you notice? Okay, and what do you notice about them as well? If I type them, they are italicized, okay? But I can't, I can't italicize very well when I write. So when you handwrite these, you gotta underline it to let us know that that's what you meant, okay? There's three rules when we do these. This is capitalized, this is lowercase, one, two, and then three, we underline. Does that make sense? Not a lot of stuff to it. My kids, we fought about that some last year. They couldn't keep that in their head. It's not hard, all right? Genus is capitalized. Species is lowercase. 
underline it. If you're typing it, italicize it. Okay. Now with that, and it's not, this is not in the notes, so make sure you stay with me here. How do we classify things? Well, we start out in the kingdom. And what kingdom are we are we working with this semester? Animalia. Okay? Kingdom. Phylum. We will be working in the phyla quite a bit. Uh, class. Order. Family. Genus. And species. Now, why am I writing all this? Well, if we're a human and we want to classify a human and make sure we know darn well how a human differs from a, a dog or um, uh, an E. coli bacterium or whatever, okay? Genus, Homo sapiens, right? Um, we are animate animals, right? Uh, phylum, we are chordata. Uh, class, I don't remember in here, we're primates, and there are some other breakdowns in here, I think we're order primates, I don't really remember. We work here, mainly, and here in this class, okay? So I don't know, you know, I'd have to look it up to see what, where does this fall, all right? But how do I remember what order they're in? Right? Would, it, would a cow have the exact same layout? No, we'd have different stuff here. We'd have boss, taurus here. Um, they'd be ungulates. They'd still be animals and chordates, because they have a backbone, but this would change, okay? So this is like saying you are, this is your name. This is what, uh, this is your first name. This is your last name. This is what class you're in. This is what high school you're in. This is what town you live in. Does that make sense? We're really classifying and telling, saying exactly what this animal is. Now, how did I remember what order these things fall in? Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Well, believe me, I've had 30 years of this, so some of it comes pretty natural, but some of it doesn't. And every now and again, I still got to stop and think what goes where. The way I remember it is with a mnemonic device. A mnemonic device is something that it might be a rhyme. It might be something that starts with the same letters whatever to help you remember. Well, I remember this. King, Philip, comes over for great spaghetti. Okay, it's a pretty easy rhyme, right? Honestly. I don't remember the spaghetti. I use the PG-13 version in my head. Okay. If some of you, is, you're going to remember it better. If you say King, King Philip comes over four great spaghetti. Okay. In this class, it's spaghetti. No, it's not. You can remember it either way. I don't, I'm not, you know, it's not a big deal. Whatever helps you remember the order these are in, that will be a test question at some point, quiz question, whatever. Okay, or I'll leave out like two of these and say what goes here. You guys need to know. Okay, questions on that. Okay, moving on. Slide number four, looks like. There are 13 of these, two of them are, are title slides, so this goes pretty quick. A population, so we just had a species, right? We had an organism, then we had a species, now we have a population. Get rid of this real quick. Population is group of, uh, a group of the same species in a particular area. So we could talk about the Branta canadensis, right? The Canada geese that live in Melton. We're talking about a species, a single species, right? The Canada goose. And where do they live? In Melton. Okay? It doesn't really matter where you're talking about as long as you kind of have that one area. If I wanted to say, hey, um, the school, uh, or yeah, let's look at uh, COVID exposure in a certain school in Belton. That, that's what we want to look at, right? We want to look at um, this one particular class, maybe, in this one particular school. We have to say what area we're looking at. We're not just looking at all of Missouri, 
right? That's a good thing to know, but does it affect us as much as if there's 20 kids that are sick in Belton High School, that, that affects us more, right? Okay, so we could, if you use your imagination, when you talk about the freshman class, would be like the species in Belton High School. That would be the area. Now we're talking about a population of uh, freshmen. Are we talking about the 11th graders in Belton? No. Are we talking about the freshmen at Raypet? No, we're talking about these specific ones in this specific area. Okay. Now, if I talk about the number of cats in the city of Belton, is that going to be the same number as if I'm talking about the population of cats in the Kansas City area? No, it'd be a much smaller number. What about Missouri? Well, then that number gets bigger. What about the U.S., right? It depends on what population you're talking about as far as you know, what, what area are you looking at. That makes sense? Questions on pop? Okay. Moving on. Community is the next one. Different populations in an area that are interacting with each other become a community. So we have organism, species, population, community. Okay. Are all the members of a community the same species? No. Okay. What I want you guys to do in this class, raise your hand if you're a senior. Okay. I've got what four of you. Okay. Now let's consider that the seniors are a different species than the juniors. Okay. So we have a population of seniors and a population of juniors. They're all in the same room, right? But now they're two different species interacting. What do we now have? A community. This room is now a community. If we throw in teachers as a third species, that's just something else that we can kind of toss in there, right? Okay, questions on this? Not too hard. You gotta know each, each step though, okay? Ecosystem is the next step. I'm just going to wrap this down here. Ecosystem. What is an ecosystem? It is everything in that area, living and non-living, biotic, meaning it is alive or has been alive, it's organic, abiotic, everything else. So let's talk about just this room. Okay, let's say this is the ecosystem, this room. What are the biotic factors in this room? What's that? The biotic, the living things. What, what, what would form that part of this ecosystem? Us, right? If you have any food, that's probably a biotic, right? Because, you know, you got apples, meat, something. It was probably alive at one point. Now, there could be some abiotics, too, if it's really salty food or something, you know, there's part of that, but mainly it's a biotic factor. What would be abiotic in this room? The desks, right? Uh, the cabinets, uh, the, the, the light, the air, the temperature, yeah. the room is the walls, right? The, the floor, anything that we interact with but it's not alive, but it never was, right? Now you could probably, I don't know, like the wooden cabinets or something, eventually they might rot. And then we could say, okay, that's a biotic factor, right? It's, 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 it's something that decomposed, okay? But for the most part, it's the stuff that we interact, it's not living, it never was. If I have a word and I throw the prefix A in front of it, what does it mean? What is A as a prefix? Non, right? We have biotic, it was alive, or it is alive. Abiotic, non-living. Does that mean it's dead? Were rocks ever alive? Was the air ever alive? Was the light ever alive? No, okay. So A, it's not exactly the same as anti, but it just kind of, it's, it's along the same lines, non or opposite of, 
right? Like antibiotics are different than abiotic. The antibiotics will kill life, but they kind of go along the same, they mean essentially the same thing, either you know, opposite of, okay? Not exactly, but pretty close. So let's talk about the Rocky Mountains. Let's talk about the biotic factors. What lives in the Rocky Mountains? What kind? Bears, right? Elk, deer, uh, conifer trees, um, eagles, uh, different wildflowers. I mean, anything is alive, right? What are some abiotic factors of the Rocky Mountains? The rocks, the rocks, the boulders, right? The mountains themselves, right? Uh, what about the mountain streams? The snow, the water, that type of stuff, okay? The, the fresh, clean air, right? The amount of light it gets, the temperature, probably colder in the Rocky Mountains, depending on where you're at, right? Let's talk about how that difference differs from the Florida Keys. Do we have the exact same biotic factors in the Florida Keys? No, right? Now we've got sharks and gators and Burmese pythons and, and, and swampy type of plants and things. Do we have the exact same abiotic factors? Do we have any mountains in Florida? Nope. We've got sandy beaches, right? We've got salt water and fresh water, but we don't have salt water in the mountains, okay? So there's a different thing. We've got more humidity, right? It's, it's just the temperature's different because we're closer to the equator, right? Okay. All right, so the biosphere. Bio again means what? Bio is what? what? Life, living, right? Okay, so biosphere is the last stop on, on this chain of where we're going. A sphere is just a what? It's a 3D circle, right? You guys remember that from um, geometry, probably, and probably from, you know, third, fourth grade, right? You learned what a sphere is. It's no longer just a circle. Now it's three-dimensional. It's a sphere. Anywhere on this planet where life exists is the biosphere, okay? So I'm going to draw this, and it's not going to be to scale. I'm going to label it with an E because it's Earth. I'm going to put not to scale because it will not be at all. We've got around the planet a protective layer, which is known as the what? The atmosphere, okay? And it extends roughly seven miles above the surface of the planet. And I probably should say it's, it's in, in kilometers, right? Because miles, is, this is a science uh, class. We should probably be using metric. Back when I was your age in 93, 94, uh, by the year 2000, the United States was going to be purely on the metric system. Here's 2020. How'd that work out for everybody? <laughs> I can do a lot of the conversions in my head, but we don't have, I accidentally did that in my car the other day. I hit the thing that made it go from miles per hour to kilometers per hour. And all of a sudden I'm like, I don't think I'm going that fast, but it, say, it says I'm going, you know, a lot. And it, I had hit that and it, I was going much slower, but the number was much higher. So. Anyway, so about seven miles out from the surface of the Earth. Also, if you go to the deepest part of the ocean, we're looking at about seven miles deep into the planet, okay? Not really into the core, right? But, you know, under the, the or down between the tectonic plates and whatnot. Got another seven miles. So we got about 14 miles interior and exterior to the Earth where life can, can, live, okay? I'm not gonna say it flourishes, because it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't thrive. What could be living, I mean, what's the main thing you're gonna probably find at the very deepest depth or way out there in the clouds? What's about the only life form you guys are gonna think of? Think tiny, bacteria, okay? I had somebody last period say, well, birds, they don't live seven miles out. Like, there's not enough oxygen, they would not do well. And it's really cold, so. Um, but that's a biosphere, does that make sense? It's like a, a hollow sphere 
around our planet. That's where life can be. Okay. Next slide is just a uh, title slide, species interaction. And we'll move on past that. Symbiosis. Okay. Uh, symbiosis should be a review. You probably remember one or maybe two of those. The third one will probably snag you if you're trying to think of it. It did me the other day. I, I was like, parasitism, mutualism. I know there's a third. Oh, yeah, co uh, commensalism, not communism. That's a different thing. Commensalism. Okay. Anytime two organisms live together in a very close relationship where one, at least one of them, depends on the other one for something, that's symbiosis. Okay. The first one I have up there is parasitism. That's the one you guys are for sure probably going to remember because you all know what parasites are, right? What are they? They feed off of other things. They take advantage of somebody and either, you know, suck their blood, right? Or uh, they live in their guts and they, they pull nutrients out of their intestines or, you know, just gross stuff, right? So the way I have it here, one organism gains, I put that in green so you guys can see, somebody always gets something out of the deal, right? In this case, the parasite gains, it lives, right? It has a host, it does real well. The other one is harmed in parasitism. If I am the host, is it helping me to have something sucking my blood? No, because now I am having to divert energy to give some other organism. It's not helping me, it could be harming me quite a bit. Commensalism, one organism gains, they always gain, but the other one doesn't care, all right? The, the example I a lot of times use for this are remoras. You guys know what a remora is? Yeah. Okay, and what is it? It's one of those things like, like, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. It is, a remora is also known as a pilot fish. Remoras have a suction cup on the top of their head. They stick up under a shark, usually right about you know, under the jaw line, okay? What do they do? So, so who gains out of this, this deal? The shark or the remora? The remora, right? Remora gets a ride. Remora gets protection. Where is there a safer spot than under the jaw of a shark? Probably not, okay? And they also get what? What's the main reason they do this? You guys ever seen a shark eat? It is, it is bloody and it is, it is messy, okay? Chunks of fish going everywhere. If I'm a remora, what am I doing? I am catching all of that, right? Uh, essentially, they get a free ride through a buffet and they catch all the stuff that comes off the shark's plate and they eat it, okay? Now, does that harm the shark in any way? Not really, right? I mean, it's not, I mean, if I'm a 20 foot shark, uh, uh, tiger shark, and I've got a two foot remora stuck to me, and I don't even know it's there. I don't even care, okay? It's not hurting me any, it's not sucking my blood, it's just stuck to me. Not hurting me any, okay? Mutualism, mutual. Mutual means both organisms gain. All right, um, we'll talk about uh, crocodiles. If I'm a crocodile, I've got a long mouth, right? I've got teeth down at the end. I've got short, stubby, little reptile arms, right? My legs, how many of you guys have ever been eating something, maybe it's popcorn, maybe it was jerky, and you got something stuck in your teeth, and you worked and worked and worked with your tongue trying to get that out, and it just drove you nuts, okay? It happens to crocs as well, all right? If I'm a crocodile, and I've got something stuck in my teeth down here at the end, right? Can I get it with my little stubby four, four legs? Nope, I'll dig all day. Can I get it with my tongue? Probably not. What, what difference is it gonna make? Why, you know, if I've got some, some meat stuck in my teeth, what's gonna happen? Why is that a bad thing for me? Can't do anything about it. It's gonna irritate the area, right? It might cause, it, it might start to rot and you know, either you know, rot out my teeth or, or start you know, getting into my gums. It's gonna hurt. I'm not gonna dig it, right? Crocodiles, actually will slide up on the bank, they'll go ahead and open their jaws, and little birds called plovers will come in, okay? They will step right into the crocodile's jaws, and they'll start pulling the dead 
and rotting meat out of their teeth. Okay? Is that a benefit to the crocodile? Sure it is, right? They're getting their teeth cleaned. It's a dental visit. Is it anything to the, to the birds? Sure, they're getting a meal out of it. They're eating the, the meat, all right? They dig it out of the teeth and hey, that's, that's cool. It's already been kind of chewed up. It's good, right? Um, it's also protectionary, right? Who's gonna mess with you when you're in a crocodile's mouth? The crocodiles don't, don't eat them. They could, but it's like this big. It'd be like eating a single skittle. It's not gonna do you any good, okay? There's not a lot of energy to them and they're doing you a favor, okay? People are like, well, crocodiles aren't that smart. <laughs> You'd be surprised. So the new research is showing that, you know, the reptilian brain, everybody's like, oh, the reptilian brain is just so good. No, they're, they're smart in a different way than we are, okay? All right, moving on. Almost done. Autotroph versus heterotroph. Yeah, you have your... Run it back to Mr. Priest, he'll get you, he'll sign you up. Okay, so autotrophs. Auto means what? So, troph, in this case, is like energy flow. Think of it as to eat. Autotrophs eat themselves then, right? Is that, is that what I'm saying? No, they do what though? They make their own, make their own food. Okay? If I'm an autotroph, I make my own food. Plants are autotrophs. What, what uh, process do plants use to make their own food? Photosynthesis, good. Okay. Autotrophs are also known as producers. So you ought to be able to use autotroph and producer interchangeably. Why do I call them producers? They produce food, right? Okay. Heterotroph. Hetero means other. They have to eat other things. They cannot make their own food. All right. Now, they, uh, they're known as consumers because they consume somebody else. They can eat just producers, and we call those herbivores. Now, vor also means to eat, V-O-R. Uh, where do we get devour from? That's the same root word, vor, vour, right? So if we just eat producers, we're an herbivore. Some of you guys might say herbivore, and that's fine either way. I prefer herbivore because we grow herbs in our garden, not herbs. Okay, herb is, is a guy's name, okay? Herb is, is the plant, so I just say herbivores. If they eat other consumers, they are carnivores, carne meaning what? Meat, good. Or if they eat both, they're omnivores. Omni means all or every, okay? They are not picky. So let's look at, uh, let's classify a tiger. Is a tiger a producer or a consumer? It's a consumer, obviously, okay? Is it a herbivore, carnivore, or omnivore? What? Carnivore, right? Okay, when we talk about the, the big cats, uh, lions, tigers, cheetahs, uh, things like that, pumas, they are what's known as a super carnivore, meaning all they ever eat is meat. They don't go look at, even if, I, they would starve to death if they didn't have meat. That's, that's all they eat, okay? They can't, no, they, can, there's, they, can't, they can't digest it, they get nothing from it, okay? Some of these other animals, though, we're gonna talk about, they do. What if I'm a giant panda? What do I eat? Uh, they're herbivores, right? What do they eat? Bamboo, that's all they eat. That's all they eat, okay? They got big, sharp teeth, right? Like, like North American bears but they eat bamboo, they're herbivores. Talking about North American bears, they're not on there, but let's talk about it. Let's talk about a grizzly bear. What is it? Technically, they're omnivores, okay? Yeah, they got those giant sharp teeth, right? They like meat, but they also like berries and roots and stuff like that, okay? Bears are, they're like pigs. They'll eat about anything, okay? How about a cow? They're herbivores, right? Now, somebody asked last period, well, what happens? Don't they sometimes chew up like beetles and grasshoppers? And well, sure, okay? They're not going out of their way trying to catch beetles and grasshoppers. 
But yeah, if I'm eating a whole bunch of grass, I'm not really paying attention to what's going in. I'm not looking for it. I'm I'm at a herbivore. How about people? We're omnivores, okay? Now, some of you might go, well, I'm a vegan. That's fine. You made that choice. Physiologically, you eat meat and plants, okay? You can do that, all right? What about a dog? Omnivore. Dogs will eat anything. If you have a dog, they'll, they'll eat about anything. What's that? They eat grass, right? It's not so much that they eat the grass. What, what does grass do for a dog? It helps to essentially it irritates their stomach so bad that they vomit. So it's medicine for a dog. Is really kind of way you see it. Trophic levels and energy flow. There's a lot of stuff on that slide. Okay. The main thing I need you to know. All right. What what is a trophic level? Where it's where are you? Are you are you at the top of the food chain? Or are you at the bottom? Are you somewhere in the middle? And are is it always the same? No. Right? We were talking about that the other day. If, if, if I were to drop you in the middle of the ocean, are you still king, king, king of the food chain? <laughs> no, you went down a step or two, right? What I need you to get off of this. Producer, the first thing to eat that is what? A primary consumer. Next thing to eat that is a secondary, tertiary. You can go out quaternary. Right? We're not going that far. We're going to tertiary. That's good enough. And you can just go out to fight for it. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's we'll get into some of that. What I need you to see, though, the main thing you need to look at is the math that's on that slide. So let me let me actually just draw it. Okay, so I am I'm grass, and I get my energy from the the sun. I get about a hundred percent of the energy that the sun releases and strikes the planet, and I use it. Okay. <laughs> I did not see that. that. That sounds about right, too. Okay, now let's say I'm a, I'm a grasshopper. What is this? What kind of consumer? It's the first thing to eat the grass, so it's a primary. I'm just going to put a one prime. That's that's primary. Primary consumer. It only gets about ten percent of the energy that came from the sun. Now, if I'm a I'm a bird of some sort, and I eat that grasshopper, how much? How much of the sun's energy do I get? Or how much of the, the energy that initially hit the grass? I'm at about 1% now. I'm a secondary consumer. Okay, and let's say I'm a, oh, that's a terrifying looking cat. That was supposed to be a cat. It looks like Snarf. So I'm a hungry cat. Yes. Uh, what they eat is very fibrous and it takes a long time for them to, to digest it. There's just not, and there's not a lot of energy in it. I mean, that's, you know, you look at a cow, how many stomachs does a cow have? Four. It takes four stomachs to really digest the stuff. It's got plenty of uh, bacteria in there to help digest what it eats, but it takes a long time to get through that, right? Um, I said it in my last class. Uh, the best, the best, if you want the most bio available food source, you would be a cannibal. The closer the meat is to your own meat, the better off you are, right? As far as just the most available, bioavailable stuff is that way. Now, if I'm a cat and I eat this bird, now I'm down to about point, about point one percent of the initial energy. So how much do I lose with every step? Minus 90%. What's 1% of, of 10? It's minus 90, right? It's 10%. Minus 90. Every step on this, on this trophic level, or every, every trophic level, you lose 90%. Okay? 
you only get about 10% of whatever the last thing had, okay? Um, so what trophic level are you when you eat a steak? Where are you? What kind of consumer are you if you eat a steak? Probably a, probably a secondary, right? Because you probably, the cow probably didn't eat anything other than the grass. What if you're eating a salad? You're a primary consumer, okay? If you have a, a hamburger with lettuce and tomato on it, you're both, you're both primary and secondary consumer at that point, right? And if you're eating a cow that somehow ate a hamburger, then you'd be tertiary as well, you yeah. know? Okay, food chain versus food web. Food chain, if I take a chain and lay it out, what do I make? A straight line, okay? Food chain is a straight line. Food web looks like a spider web. It's all, well, it's more of the possible interactions. So if I have grass, or plants of some sort, and let's say I've got a grasshopper, I'll just put hopper. Okay, and a bird, and that gets eaten by a hawk. Let's say a bluebird, something like that, okay? Gets eaten by a hawk, gets eaten by an eagle. What did I just make? Is this food chain or food web? Why? It's going in a circle, that does not make it a web. If I take a, ch a chain and I lay it in a circle, I've still got a chain. Notice, it all goes just one direction and it all goes from, from here to there. How am I drawing the arrows? Well, assume they're straight. <laughs> assume they're not ugly arrows. Where is the arrow going? It's following, it's going to the consumer. It is following the energy movement, right? The energy is coming from the grass to the grasshopper's mouth to the bluebird, right? To the hawk. Now, if you ever, if we ever screw up and we draw it like this instead, you better not go out barefoot in your front lawn. Why? Grass is eating grasshoppers for crying out loud at this point, right? You got issues if you got grass that's taking in energy from some, uh, something else, okay? So make sure you always draw the arrow going the right way. Now, let's say instead of a bluebird eating a grasshopper, now I've got a frog eating a grasshopper. Or maybe I've got a spider eating a grasshopper. Can a frog eat a spider? Sure. Can a hawk eat a frog? Yep. Uh, maybe the bluebird, maybe the eagle just eats it. You know, anyway, what did I now make? Is it still a food chain? No, now it's food web. Now I've got a food chain here. I've got a food chain here. I've got a food chain here. It makes a web. Okay, questions on that? Good. All right, last slide. Closing in, this is a quick one. You may not even need to write anything down off of this. Predator-prey relationships. Prey is what gets eaten. Predator is what do, does the eating. Is that new to you? No, I would not write it in your notes. Why? Because it will just be extra stuff, right? And it'll screw you up. If you're trying to find something quick, you're gonna have to read through all this. You already know this? Sure. If I were to write up there on the, on the notes, the sky is blue and water is wet. Some of you would want to probably write it down. Why? Because you just impulsively have to write it, everything down. But you don't need to. If you know something already, just leave it out, okay? Uh, then we can talk about decomposers. They break down every organism and recycle the nutrients back in the ecosystem, okay? They're the, they're the ultimate winners of the whole energy game. Why? They're the last thing that gets a hold of it, okay? But then it all recycles anyway, so. Any questions? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the Zoom recording here. Maybe.